Section 8.4, you could say is about mass moments and center of mass. However, it's really a bit more broad than that. And because of that, you might want to say mass in quotes, moments in quotes, and center of mass in quotes, because these ideas could include, for example, finding the population of a city. And in fact, the book does kind of a funny example. You got a city that's circular in shape and the population density of people per square mile varies along uh, a radial function. In other words, it's constant along circles of a constant radius centered at the center of the city. And based on, yes, that's a weird assumption. Based on that weird assumption, that'd be very rarely true. You can then find the population of the city and that would be like its mass. That's why I'm putting mass in quotes here. However, for the sake of time, let's restrict our attention during class to physical objects and think about literal mass moments in center of mass that you might be wondering, what is a moment? So like a moment of inertia, it's related to that, yeah. First review, we have talked about mass of thin rods before. Let's review that. And let's also think about it in terms of what we've been discussing more recently here in chapter eight, Riemann sums and infinitesimal approach. So we have a thin rod. How thin? Uh, you know, this is modeling. It's not meant to be perfect. Just imagine it to be really thin, like a thin wire or something, but I'm calling it a rod. Is it stiff or is it bendable? Don't worry about it. It's got, it could have a density that's constant. That would be the simplest thing to do. But then there's no calculus. So that's no fun. We want to allow for a density that's not constant. It's convenient to imagine you've laid it along some axis, an x axis, say, and you've picked a point to be the origin, most conveniently probably the left side of the rod, zero. The rod's got a certain length, say capital L. We're interested in the mass of the rod when we know the mass density of the rod. Why not just weigh it? That's no fun, we wanna do some calculus. This, the, the, these, these comments are meant to be mildly humorous, yes, but this, this problem solving stuff that we're doing is still useful. It will be useful, for example, for us in a more concrete way, perhaps, more believable way, perhaps, when we talk more about probability and statistics, as we will later this week, even. Friday, we should talk about that more. Stuff we talk about now will have application there, and that definitely has real life applications. It's easy, easy for me to imagine that instead of like, you might call these phony physical problems. Before we used rho of x for the density function, but that's not what our book uses here. They use delta of x for the density function. I don't know why. It will have the enjoyable benefit of, we'll be multiplying delta of x times delta x there will be two deltas, a lowercase and an uppercase delta, and that'll be just kind of fun. Delta of x times delta x. This is a function. This is the, you could call it a linear mass density. Say, with certain units, maybe grams per centimeter. That's how I typically imagine it, but it could be something different. It's linear, it's mass per unit length, not mass per unit volume as you usually think of density. Because we're effectively imagining this rod to be so thin that it's effectively one dimensional. 
Maybe it's one molecule thick. Nah, don't go there. All right? That'd be a, going a little too far. It's a mathematical idealization. May not reflect reality perfectly. Linear mass density, it's a function of x. Let's think about a particular value of x. So I'm using x in two ways, as an axis label and, you know, which you could say it's a variable name as a, and as a specific location that I've drawn. I get out my knife, I chop this thin rod up into a bunch of tiny pieces of a certain tiny width, say delta x. And I'm interested in the tiny mass of that tiny piece, delta m mass of tiny piece. If the density were constant, even over the entire rod, the total mass is the density in grams per centimeter constant times the length in centimeters. Grams per centimeter times centimeters, the centimeters would cancel and getting you grams. That would be the mass. The density is not constant though, it varies. However, if this piece is small enough and if this function is continuous, it's not going to change much in value over that tiny piece. It's effectively constant. I could approximate the tiny mass as a product. Delta of x times delta x. And there we get to use the two different deltas. This is in grams per centimeter. This is in centimeters. Yes, the centimeters would cancel giving you a quantity in grams. It is a mass unit. And this would be an approximation for that tiny mass. The total mass of the entire thin rod, you could call just a plain old M without a delta, is the sum of the tiny masses. And that would be approximately a sum like this. And when you have sums like that, where you have some function of a variable there times the change in the variable, then you say you jump for joy and say, hey, that's a Riemann sum for an integral for this function. Now we let delta x go to zero, and the approximately equal to becomes an exactly equal to when we change the summation sign to an integral. It's kind of like magic. You imagine the delta x morphing into a dx and the summation sign morphing into an integral sign. Is that really what's going on? No, it's just for fun. It's, a, it's more boring than that. It's a definition, but you, but you do need to prove the definition makes sense. Actually, again, if you take real analysis, you prove a more general approach to Riemann sums and it's, it actually becomes a theorem that you'll get the integral. Um, over whatever interval that you're integrating over, in this case, from zero to L. If I had picked my coordinate system differently, by the way, if I had decided that instead of that being zero, it was say seven, and this was seven plus L, I could still do all this and I'd integrate from seven to seven plus L, though the delta of X function would change according to that change of coordinates. So it's not just a matter of changing the interval here. You'd have to change the function too. Its formula would change, though it would give it the same values for the density of the rod at each location. That'll be the mass. If you were taking the infinitesimal approach, infinitesimal approach, what would you do? All the capital deltas become Ds. And the approximately equal to's become equal to's. You'd write dm equals delta of x dx. You would imagine this to be a product of a, a regular number times an infinitesimal number to give you an infinitesimal number. Then you'd say to yourself, to get the total mass, I have to add up the little masses where the, you're imagining the integral sign to mean add. In other words, I have to add up things like this. And then you say, okay, no more fun. 
I have to actually do the integral to get an answer, and I have to, that means I need limits of integration. And you find write the same integral to do. You get the same integral in the end is the point. Is either of these approaches rigorous? Not really, not in the way I'm doing it at least. You may, maybe you say this is a tiny bit more rigorous, but in both cases, you're just trying to think intuitively to try to get the integral that you do to get the answer. I'm gonna continue with this, but let's take an example. Let's imagine delta of x equals x squared grams per centimeter. So for any value of x, this gives you the linear density at that location. For example, delta of two is two squared is four grams per centimeter at location four. The density near four is approximately four grams per centimeter. Multiply that, that times the length of the tiny piece, you'd get the mass of the tiny piece. And let's say the interval here, the length is three centimeters. In this kind of situation, the mass would be the integral from zero to three of x squared. That'll be one third x cubed from zero to three, and that'll end up being nine grams would be the mass of such a thing. We've talked about all this before. What's something new? Something new today is the moments in the center of mass. That's new. To talk about those things, we need to talk about a discrete situation first, not continuous. Imagine a number line where zero is some point on the number line. I picked it to be right there. And let's say you've got three masses on this number line. Maybe one mass, M1 at this location, X1. I made this to the left of zero, so X1 would be negative. Maybe M2 is right there and it's at location X2 and M3 is right here, it's at location X3. What I'm ultra, ultimately interested in is the center of this center of mass of this system of three point particles. What's a point particle? What, an electron? Are there electrons here that, well, they could be, but you could also just do a mathematical idealization and imagine these masses to be say people sitting on a teeter-totter. Seesaw, what do you prefer? I say both, teeter-totter, seesaw. Where should you put the fulcrum so that they balance? That'd be the center of mass. Now, technically what I'm about to say has to be verified experimentally based on the law of the lever, or is it the law of the lever? I think it's lever. Based on the law of the lever, what I'm about to write down mathematically speaking has to be verified experimentally. You construct what are called moments of these things. The moments of the masses. What are the moments for each mass with respect to the origin? I should say with respect to the origin. Are the products of the masses with their positions, M1 times X1? m2 times x2, and m3 times x3. Why are they called moments? I have no idea. They have nothing to do with time. People use this terminology, we're kind of stuck with it. What do they represent? Well, a negative moment, if this is a teeter-totter here, is reflecting the fact that that mass with a negative moment tends to rotate this teeter-totter counterclockwise. M1, since X1 is negative, would tend to rotate the teeter-totter. If I put the, put the fulcrum at the origin, is what I meant to say. If I put the fulcrum at the origin, M1 is tendering, tending to cause a counterclockwise rotation. M2 and M3, since X2 and X3 are positive, give you positive moments, tending to give you a clockwise rotation. And yes, the size of the moment in magnitude 
you might say would reflect how fast the rotation would be or the acceleration of the rotation. I'm not going to get into details. Those are the moments of the mass, masses themselves. What's the total moment of the system with respect to the origin? That's a zero, not an O. You could call it, say, capital M from moment. Capital M is going to represent the moment. I could also call these capital M1, capital M2, and capital M3. Um, it would be the sum of these individual moments. M1, X1, plus M2, X2, plus M3, X3. It's effectively just a definition. But it's a def definition that's useful. The center of mass, center of mass, denoted with the letter X bar, actually some people use X sub CM for center of mass. X bar is more of like a statistical kind of symbol, is defined to satisfy the property that the total moment, capital M, is the same as the moment you would get if you took all the masses, put them at the location X bar. Say that again. The center of mass is defined to be the location so that the total moment, which could, the capital M here, could be replaced by, by the summation here, has to equal the moment you would get if you put all three masses at the same spot, X bar. This defines the center of mass, and you have to verify experimentally that it is the location to put the fulcrum to make it balance safe. You got to verify that experimentally. And this is equivalent, you could solve it for X bar, to X bar being capital M divided by M1 plus M2 plus M3. In other words, this sum divided by that sum. I'm going to write the top sum in a different way. I'm going to put the X's first. X1, M1 plus X2, M2 plus X3, M3 divided by M1 plus M2 plus M3. In general, if you've got n point masses, in general, with n point masses, x bar, the analogy here is it's still a ratio of two summations. i goes from one to n, xi times mi divided by the summation i goes from one to n of mi. Careful in my notation here, capital M does not represent the total mass. It represents the total moment. I could, I could call the total mass the summation. I could call this little m. But this summation is capital M. This could be written as capital M divided by little m. What are the units for these things? Little m is a mass. This is in um, grams. Capital M is a moment. It's products like these that are being added. It actually has units of grams times centimeters. The grams would cancel, leaving you with unit, units of centimeters. X bar, the center of mass, is a location. This is not, this is not center of mass. This is centimeters right there. Maybe I should have used meters. Oh, but that would be just another m. Oh, too many M's. What do we want to do now? Hang with me. We got 12 minutes left. We got to go at light speed here. We want to generalize this to not just systems of finitely many point masses, but to, well, thin rods and maybe thin plates of metal or something or three dimensional objects. Yeah. Yikes. Can we do it? 
Let's see how far we can get. What's the center of mass of my thin rod with linear density delta of x still? Linear density, again, in grams per centimeters. Again, we can still put an x-axis in here. This can still be zero. This can still be L. This can still be an arbitrary location x and a small chunk of with delta x there. What's the small moment? Think about it this way. What's the small moment of this small chunk? Imagine the thin rod being made up of a lot of small chunks. What's the small moment delta capital M of the small chunk moment of small slice or chunk. Chunk's kind of a fun word. Huh? It would be its mass times its location, just like these were masses times locations. What's its mass? Delta little m. What's its location? X. Position. But what is delta M? That was approximately delta of X times delta X, just like before. What's the total moment of the thin rod? Call it just a plain old capital M. It'd be the sum of the little moments. Would be a sum of things like this, approximately. Approximately a sum of things like this. Let me rearrange. X times delta of X times delta X. And hey, that looks like a Riemann sum for that function right there. Let delta X go to zero. The total moment, capital M, becomes the integral of X times delta of X with respect to X over the interval from zero to L. For our example, where delta of X is X squared and L was three, capital M for that example is the integral from zero to three of X times X squared, which of course that's X cubed. So you get one fourth X to the fourth, X goes from zero to three, Three to the fourth power is 81. 81 over four is 20.25. The units would be grams times centimeters, which doesn't have much meaning until you divide it by grams to get a location of centimeters for the center of mass. X bar in general is still gonna be capital M divided by little m. The total moment divided by the total mass. In terms of integrals, it's going to be the integral of x times delta of x divided by the integral of delta of x. For our example, for our example, this becomes 20.25 grams times centimeters for the moment. And the total mass was what? I forgot. Nine grams, nine grams. The grams cancel and 20.25 divided by nine is 2.25. 2.25 centimeters is the location of the center of mass for our thin rod example. 